and books. There's a wealth of wisdom available. Yes. Is the majority of John's uh, portfolio single family or commercial? He's primarily single family. Uh, That's just in Phoenix. He was like five thousand in Australia. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I have some multifamily mentors too, right? John will tell you straight up. I just don't, I don't do I don't do a commercial. He's found his niche. He's happy. He's done well. Is there a reason? Did he give you a reason why? Yeah, he, that's what he likes. He likes the consistency. He does. By the way, he does lease options. By the way, if you want to know the truth, he does 10-year lease options. And he doesn't care if they ever qualify. I bet not. <laughs> what does he want? The cash flow. He goes, I have properties I bought 28 years ago. They're still paying me rents. By the way, did the properties drop in, their, in the Phoenix properties? Did they drop in value in half in 08? Oh, no. Yeah. He goes, 95% of my folks kept paying. Did I care what the value of the property was? No. No. In fact, he'll state... I never sell a, he goes, I always sell a property for one reason. I get it back, and the neighborhood is creeped. And I can sell that property, or 1035, 1031 or something like that, and buy better or two of them in a better neighborhood to create more cash flow. If I can't create more cash flow, I just re-rent it out, re-lease option it out. Yes? Does he factor in inflation through that 10 year period, or just leave it like it is? He doesn't care. He's never selling the thing. Okay. Read his book. <laughs> now, is that the right way for you to go? I don't know. Has it worked? He has hundreds and hundreds of folks he's taught that to and have been doing it for decades. Absolutely it works. Okay. So there's a wealth of wisdom is what I'm trying to say. Uh, yeah, we talked about that already. Now, here's another thing about Wall Street. I want you to know, I want you guys, you're going to hear some odd things from me as a, as a financial guy that you don't hear otherwise. By the way, despite tremendous booms and bust cycles over the last couple decades, according to Dalbar, Dalbar is an independent statistical research study. There's many others, but they're the leaders. They've been doing this for over 30 years. They have determined that the average brokerage account in the United States over the last 20 years return has, is 2.3% net of all fees. That's looking at actual statements. I was in a, two years ago, I was in one of these rooms talking to a group in Denver. Unbeknownst to me, I was doing a workshop. The guy walked out of the room early. He was pissed. I didn't know this. Calls me back Monday and says, Ferentz, I have to apologize. I said, what do you mean? Why? He goes, I was in your workshop Saturday. You made this statement. I was pissed. I'm the CFO of a 401k company that handles 401ks for over 1,500 companies, including many Fortune 500s. They don't sell the 401ks. They're the ones that actually manage them. He goes, we have over half a million 401k accounts. I'm, he's the CFO. He goes, I went back, we've been doing it for 15 years. He goes, and I went back, he goes, I would have swore to you our average return was 6 7%. Because what do we always hear? Right. Six, What's the mantra? Yeah. What's the marketing? Right. Nothing wrong. Yes, he goes, we, I went to the actual reports of all our clients, all our 401ks. This is one of the largest 401k managers in the country. He stated to me, he says, you know what our average return over the last 15 years was for our customers? 2.1. He has four personal banks himself personally now, and he's, when I get back, he's setting up four more. That's where his personal money's going. He goes, I was like to. I would have sworn. Because, why? Because that's what you constantly hear. Even Joseph Goebbels said, you repeat a lie long, but often enough, people believe it, right? Like Wall Street, hate him, I don't really care. Can we agree they're savvy about money? Can we say they're even better about marketing? They're phenomenal, folks. Okay. You've heard it. We all have. By the way, the average fees on the average brokerage account statement, or, or average brokerage account in the U.S. is 2.2. The financial advisor has to get paid. The money manager gets paid. And if there's a middleman, an Edward Jones, Merrill Lynch, or any pick a name, they get paid too, right? So there's at least three people involved. Okay. Do you see those fees on your fees? I don't get charged that. I don't see that on my statement. Is it on the statement? Do you think they're that foolish? <laughs> no. If you went back and looked at every position you had in your mutual funds and you looked at the buy and sell dates and all the different transactions, which would be hundreds in most cases, and let's say you averaged a 5% return, that all those transactions are averaging 5% return, your statement would say something like three. They pulled it off the top, folks. Okay, I'm just wanting to say, now, am I saying never invest in the stock market or, or, or the market? 
or with a financial advisor? No, I didn't say that. What I said was know what's going on and do it with your eyes open. Is that fair? That's called financial literacy. That's called knowledge. That's called power. Understand the real deal. What's going on? In fact, how many people have ever done a real estate deal where you've had a money partner and a sweat equity partner? A lot of you. What's the typical deal? 50-50, right? All right? So Wall Street deals no different. The average investor makes about 2.3, and the average fees are about 2.2. <laughs> You're the money partner. They're the sweat equity partner. Don't let them fool you. I don't care what they say. All right? Now, if that's worth it to you, do it. I have no problem with that. But I want you to know the truth and know going in. And if it's worth it to you, do it. But no, going in. Is that fair? Are they, are they worth, is your partner worth 50% of the future gains? That's the question you have to answer. Okay? That's the deal. Okay. We all know that if, not, if they're not, then you have options. You can manage your own money. We've all heard of day traders and folks like that, right? The problem is, that takes a lot of time, doesn't it? Most of us have a life, okay? Can't be on in front of a computer screen every hour that the markets are open, can you? Okay. There's alternative investments like real estate, like you're here, which do require specialized knowledge and time, don't they? And if you're a fan of that and that's your thing, cup of tea, great. Take the time to learn the specialized knowledge and take the time to do it. And you can be successful at that, okay? And then you can control your own. Also, I'm going to add the third piece. You can control your money through a personal bank. And that's what we're going to really talk about today. Oh, and the last thing I want to say to this is, although most financial advisors, and I'm talking about 99.9% .9 charge fees, they don't have to. They can. We can charge fees too. Just so you know, I mentioned, we get paid. Guess what? If any financial advisor, whatever they call themselves, fee only or whatever, I don't care what they say, do you understand if they recommend a financial product to you and you purchase it, somehow or another they get paid? Is that fair? Okay. They should get paid. Okay? I get paid too. Most also charge fees on top, so they get, or they get paid twice. Yes. We've chose not to do that. We have over 5,000 clients, so we don't need to charge fees. Most advisors don't have anywhere near that number. And that's also why the public speaking part has come into play. If I had to sit down with each one of you individually, one-on-one, -on -one, and spend a couple hours and educate you on all this stuff, it wouldn't be worth my time. I'm not being mean, I'm being honest. Unless you were a, what do you always say, have a half a million or a million in assets, liquid assets, right? Then it'd be worth the time. But if I can sit down with 20, 30, 50, 100 people at once, educate, spend the education time, and you do a little bit on your own, and then we get together, usually most of my meetings are go to meeting now, by the way, and we spend a half an hour and go to meeting answering some of your questions and look at your situation, isn't that much more time efficient for me and you? So basically what we've done is I've taken what the high level, high end financial advisors are doing and tax attorneys and brought it to the masses and made it more efficient for all of us. That's what we're doing. And I'm having fun with it. So what can I say? I like educating. So anyway, we don't charge you any fees. By the way, that 2.2 average, we, don't, we do exactly the same thing your financial advisor is doing. We get you the exact same results. In 10 years, how much more money do you have? 22% more money, not count calling, not figuring out compounding. Are you happy? Yes. I think you understand why we have a 98.7% retention rate in our company. People like us. Okay, so that's why. Now I'm going to share. One, I'm going to throw a couple little quick financial. Just I have to do this. Some financial literacy things because I could teach you how a personal bank works. I can give you all the ins and outs and all the details and everything right now. And if you don't have a few of the basic key components of financial literacy in place, you will fall down on your face and not succeed. Is that fair? Okay? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time with these. If you want more information on these, I'll be happy to do that. Because I'm, I'm going to condense four hours into two is what I'm doing today. So you're getting kind of a, a, a Cliff Notes version. Okay? <clears throat> the first financial rule, and the one I find that financial literacy rule that's broken the most often, is called the 80-10-10 rule. Now, what is the 80-10-10 rule? By the way, how long has it been around? It's in the Bible. Thank you. <laughs> and every financial book you have ever read, like uh, 
Anybody read Richest Man in Babylon or uh, Acres of Diamonds or Pick a Name? These are books that have been around for 100 years. It's in there. Okay? This is not new. All right? The 80 10 10 rule is really simple. You live on 80%, <coughs> you save 10%, and you give away 10%. Now, what does that do over time? If you don't do anything with the 10%, you don't invest any, you just put it in the bank, what would it do over time? Grow. You would build a nest egg. Now, as you build a nest egg and you have cash, reserves, whatever, building up, what does that do to your stress level financially? <coughs> it's that simple, folks. Because does stuff happen? Does crap happen in life? <laughs> if it hasn't happened to you yet, just wait. <laughs> right? It will. <laughs> What's the solution to crap happening in life, financially? Having ready access to some cash. Follow the 80-10-10 rule. You will eliminate financial stress in your life. And I don't care if you do no investing. Right? Now, what's the, why give away 10%? Well, I'm a financial guy. For starters, it's good for your tax return, am I right? It's called a tax deduction. So you can reduce your income taxes. Isn't that, that's a good thing, right? But guys, guess what? It's good for the soul. Because if you can't give away 10% of what you make, you, is money ruling you or are you ruling money? In fact, one of my mentors a few years ago said something. This was tough. I'm going to tell you, this is tough. He goes, and this is how kids, by the way, kids are taught, are caught, they're actually caught more than taught. Kids learn from what you do, not what you say. Am I right, parents? And this is what my mentor said. He said, give me your calendar and your bank statement, and I will show you what's important in your life. Whoa. <laughs> that one took a while for me to give that up and let him see it. Yes. So I have a question. Yes. I have a 14-year-old daughter. Yes. And I tried to read, um, Robert Kiyosaki has a book for kids, teens. Yes. Should it just be organic and yeah. watching? More is about being caught versus taught. And if you're reading the books yourself, she'll be more inclined than want to read it. Uh, my Phoenix workshop I did last month, my 15-year-old wanted to come and did, attended the workshop I presented because she wanted to see what daddy was teaching because daddy in the last five years has changed his life. And we do, I'm not saying this to brag, I'm saying we have changed our life. We've gotten ourselves out of debt. What do you think the stress level between my wife is? She's noticed a difference. My wife said this. She goes, about a year ago, she goes, you know, we've had a lot of money. We've, we've had nothing. We've, we've lived, a, we've been married 16 years now, so we've, we've rode the roller coaster. And she goes, you know, money doesn't make you happy. Man, it sure eliminates stress. <laughs> and she's right. We are happier couple because we don't have the stress. And by the way, the last four or five years now, we've, it was important to us, we, took, we take a, a month trip now each year to, to Europe. And we take the family. And a lot of people say, you're crazy. And how do you do that owning a business and having clients and all that? And you know what I say to everybody? In July, it's stinking hot in Phoenix. We're in Europe, okay? If you need help, contact my office. i got a great staff. <laughs> if not, I'll see you in August, okay? And folks, most people respect that and understand it. And by the way, now the girls, they're like, where are we going next year, Daddy? <laughs> and what do we have to do? How can and then their friends are like, how are you doing that? And they're telling, their friends are asking them, what are they doing? And, well, they learn that it's more caught than taught, isn't it? Right? So, you start reading some books and start implementing those things, and she'll eventually come around. And it's, it's tough to start at 14, granted, but it can be done. By the way, last thing on the 80-10-10 rule i got to share with you is this. Most people, when you get a qualification, hey, I'm a banker. What, you, know, you get qualified for a half a million dollar house. What Are you real estate agents? What, what price range are you now uh, showing them? Half a million. Half a million. Why? Because you want a commission. Should they be buying a half a million dollar house? They qualified for a half a million dollar house. Do you understand that a half a million dollar qualification is the maximum amount of funds that a lender feels they'll, they'll lend to this couple or person? Because anything above that's too risky. So they're pushing the envelope. What happens when you push the envelope? Stress. Stress. And what happens if something goes wrong and you push the envelope? 
you might get away from it for a while, but you're going to get caught sooner or later. Am I right? That couple should be looking at a $400,000 house. 80-10-10 rule. 80%. That's your... So you tell the real estate agent, sorry real estate agents in the room, <laughs> but if you get approved for a 500000 we should be looking at four hundred, and the buyer should say, if you show me a four, anything over four hundred, I get a different agent. As a buyer, that's what you should do. That's what I do. By the way, is a $500,000 house nicer than a $400,000 house, typically? Is a $50,000 car nicer than a $40,000 car, usually? Is a $5,000 computer nicer than a $4,000 computer? It applies, I don't care the numbers, the zeros. It applies across the board, okay? And real estate investors, you're just as guilty because you have, a, you have some money in your pocket and you're burning to do a real estate deal, right? And what are you doing? You're looking for the property that you can maximum afford. Dumb. Mistake. <laughs> You're going to get burned. If you have the capability of purchasing half a million dollar real rental property, you should be looking at 400 k rental properties. Am I right? Or fix and flip or anything else for that matter. By the way, do contractors always get things done on time? <laughs> Never. And for, the, and the, for the original bid price? <laughs> Hello? 80-10-10 rule. Create a 10% cushion. Okay? Do that in every aspect of your life. Come back to me in a year later. And you're gonna look you're gonna look different. I have a couple I met in LA today, the third time I met them the first time a year and a half ago. They one of the gurus had told taught them to max borrow from your credit cards and do fix and flips. Then $140,000 in credit card debt, and a couple of their deals had gone south, cost them more than they thought. And I looked at their situation, and they're 60 years old, and I said, here's the deal. You want me to tell you what you need to hear, or what do you want to hear? That's how I do it nicely. And they said, give it to us. I said, I'm going to give you some suggestions of what you need to do. And if you don't listen to me, here's the name of a good bankruptcy attorney, because that's the next person you're going to need to call. Because they're going down fast. Eight grand a month in credit card bills. And he couldn't afford it. I met with him again today. They have $40,000 in credit card debt left. Their income has changed by 100 grand a year to the positive. And they were sitting there talking and laughing. And it was, they hugged me, and it was just a great lunch we had yesterday. And I looked at them, and I said, do you remember our first meeting a year and a half ago? You would have thought we were attending a funeral. Today, it's a party. And what's the difference? Your financial situation has dramatically changed in the last 18 months. They're like, you're right. And you're going to be able to retire in the time frame now that you really wanted to. They're excited. Okay, That's what it's about, folks. You didn't get into real estate to invest to create more stress, did you? Or create another job? So most of you already have one of those. Am I right? What John Burley, I love what he says. You do real estate to get freedom. So why are you going back and just creating more of the same problems and creating more stress? Okay, the financial part of it is all that, okay? So anyway, I already shared all that. The last thing I wanna share, and I'll get into good, some, uh, some details of solutions. Why am I sharing all these kinds of things? It's real simple. If you're gonna start doing things differently, you're gonna operate like the top 1%, the first thing you gotta do is start thinking differently. The most important six inches of real estate is the six inches between your ears. Get this right, and then everything else will follow. Change the thinking, change the actions, change, change the steps, okay? And things will start to change for you going forward. People will try to dissuade you and discourage you. You are doing what the one percent are doing, not the 99. Understand that going in. You decide if that person discouraging you is worth trying to convert or ignore. <laughs> right? That's your choice, that's your decision. But don't let them dissuade you unless you want to have the same results that you've had the last 10 years or 20 years. Because guess what? If you do nothing different, the next 10 or 20 is not going to get any different, is it? Okay? So, by the way, you want to be in the top 1%, this is how much you need to earn a year in the U.S. Okay? There's the bottom 20, there's the top 20. Okay? That's what it takes. Okay? Is that your goal or not? I don't know. Is it worth it to you or not? I don't know. Only you can answer that. Be honest with yourself. Okay? Is it worth it? All right? 
By the way, the last thing, budgets are similar in every respect. By the way, if I sit down with somebody who's earning half a million a year or 50000 a year, it's interesting. Their budgets on what they spend on housing, food, clothing, and all those things we all spend money on, is all percentage-wise, is almost identical, except for two areas. There's two areas that vary, and those two areas happen to be education and insurance and retirement. The top 20% top spend a lot more on those two categories, percentage-wise, than the middle class. But what I find interesting, even the poorest 20% spend a higher percentage of their income on education than the middle class. Folks, the middle class are a bunch of idiots. <laughs> I'm, have you ever heard, I graduated college, and that's the last book I ever read? That is the stupidest statement I've ever heard a person say. And I'll say that to their faith. That's the stupidest thing I've ever, you, you probably said in your life. <laughs> you should be a lifelong learner. Okay, like me, hate me, I don't care. <laughs> You're going to know where I stand. Is that fair? Hopefully, I'll respect you, you respect me. We may not agree, but, you know, there you go. All right, be a lifelong learner. By the way, the average corporate CEO in the United States, those are busy people, right? Can we agree? The average corporate CEO reads 50 books a year. The average American, 1.5, and most of those are romance novels. <laughs> sad. It's really sad. I'm not at the 50 yet. I'm working on it. I'm about halfway there. I average a couple books a month. Okay? I'm working on it. I'm still developing that habit, and I've been developing that habit for now about a decade. Okay? Wherever you're at, you don't necessarily have to get to 50 right away. Move in the right direction. Fair enough? Okay? Well, yeah, I love this one. 20-80 rule. We all know. The 20, this is another one. 80, 20% or what's it? 80% of the work gets done by 20%, right? Now, there's another category. It's called the 2% or the rock stars. If you need surgery and you get you contact a surgeon, there's an 80% chance or 80%er. Is that who you want to work on you? How about a tax attorney or CPA or financial advisor or real estate agent? or bricklayer. It doesn't matter. It applies across the board, doesn't it? Doesn't it? In other words, if you want to be in the top 2%, 1 or 2%, what's the chances of your advisor or advisors who are in the 80% able to get you there? Because if they knew how, wouldn't they be there already or on their way? Give that some thought. Again, who you hang out with, who are you listening to, and what books are you reading? Right? Now, I like to think I'm not in 80%. I'll let you guys decide if I'm a rock star or not. Is that fair? Okay? All right. We talked about that. All right. Let's move on. All right. Sustainable wealth. You guys, that's the number one financial goal for most people. And sustainable wealth is what real estate is all about. That's one of the main purposes of real estate. Okay? To create ongoing consistent income. Right? So I'm a big fan of it. Now, most people, do you know, do they have the sustainable wealth they need to live on? If the answer is no, why are you listening to them? Right? So, we talked about that. Um, I like this. Financial advisors. We're taught that people need retirement and in, uh, uh, we need uh, income in retirement, right? It's true. You do. So here's what I found out and learned. When you're just starting out your career, what do you need financially? Money, income, right? Car breaks down, the roof leaks. What do you need? You lose your job or your business. What do you need? You, you get sick or hurt and you can't work. What do you need? Cash. And yeah, you need cash. You can cash flow. More importantly, you need cash flow. You need income, right? And when you're retired, you need income. Am I right? Here's the deal you need income at every stage of your life. Don't let anybody fool you. We all do. It costs a certain amount to live. It's that simple. So, as I always say, What's the number one obstacle? <coughs> well, not enough cash flow, right? How many po folks come to me and everything's wonderful, they got all the cash flow in the world, and they come sit down with me, a financial guy, and want help? Very few. They always got problems, don't they? And it's always this. They can have big accounts, they can have big assets, but not enough cash flow. I've heard of people, real estate rich, cash poor, you've heard that one? That's not a good position to be in, is it? No, it's not smart. Okay? And think about a time. Has anybody ever had a time where you had a loss of job or, or business income? Anybody remember 0809? I sure do. It sucked. 
It's stressful, right? How do you eliminate that? Make sure you have enough cash flow coming in to at least cover the basic expenses, right? What it costs to live, right? That's how you eliminate that. Now, if the primary financial needs of our lifetime are cash flow, why do investors almost always focus on appreciation instead? Whenever you talk to somebody about an investment, what do they always say? I made X percent. Who freaking cares? That's what you should say. That should be your response. I don't care what percentage you made, because if it's in the stock market, is it going to be worth that next year? If it's a real estate deal, will that property be worth that next year? Can you answer me that question? No, you don't know. Right? Well, the answer, by the way, why do we focus on appreciation so much? Well, again, mostly comes from Wall Street, from marketing that's been shoved down our throats our entire lives. How do you make money when you invest with a typical financial advisor? Stock goes up in value, right? That's called appreciation, right? Now, how do financial advisors make money? The account goes up, down, or sideways, am I right? Is that called fees? Mm -hmm. Is that called cash flow? In fact, Wall Street's happy to give you all the appreciation. Your stock can double in value. They're happy to let you have all of it. They want the fees. Again, like Wall Street, hate them, I don't care. Which is smarter? You decide, okay? So, again, cash flow has to be secure, consistent, and positive. And it's based on your efforts, is it secure? No. Do you have to go to work to make the money? Is that a secure cash flow? No, because what if you can't go into work the next day? Right? If cash flow is based on market fluctuations, is it consistent? Of course not. And if it's based less than your expenses, is it positive? And obviously that's an answer is no. So the solutions is make more, increase your income, spend less, reduce your burn rate, and do some of both, capture the interest. Some of you need to do some of both of these. I'm going to teach you how to do the third. Okay? That's what the wealthy do. All right. That's how you can create sustainable wealth. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this on the problems because I really want to get to the solution. The problem, main problems are consumer debt, taxes, and market risk. I'm going to touch on them real quick. Some people out there may have heard of a guy, what's, it, uh, what's his name, uh, teaches getting out of debt all the time on the radio. Dave Ramsey, thank you. You know, Dave Ramsey. I'm not opposed to getting out of debt, don't get me wrong, but a blanket statement you should be out of debt is, is really, really foolish because that may not apply to you, okay? Anytime somebody says a blanket statement, this is good or that's bad, I, I actually helped co-author a, a book called Bad Advisors. The whole purpose of that book is, um, in the foreword is one of the sections, um, it's about a pet peeve in the industry. You run into financial advisors particularly that say, this is great, that's bad, if they make blanket statements like that, run away. Every financial tool has a purpose that there's bad fits. I see round pegs and square holes all the time, absolutely. But don't tell me a certain financial tool is bad across the board, because it's not. It's designed for a certain purpose. It may be bad for you, just a bad fit, that's all. Being out of debt for one person completely may be a great fit. For my wife and I, after what we went through, emotionally, that was a great fit. Make sense? Okay. Now, the difference understanding on debt. I'll just hit this and then move on with the next point. It's understanding the difference between strategic debt and, and consumer debt. Okay. Strategic debt is debt payments are made from someone else's efforts. A great example is a rental property. Can you build wealth that way? Oh yeah. yeah. Somebody else is paying the payments for you. That's strategic debt. That's known as good debt. Bad debt is consumer debt. If you have to work for it to pay pay the bill, get rid of that and get rid of it as quick as possible. Okay? Because that's what will cause you problems when things go, go, go south or go wrong, right? And mortgages, we all know, are designed never to end. By the way, after seven years, you owe 97% of the principal on a 30-year fixed mortgage, irregardless of the interest rate. Do you know that? And the average American re moves or refinances every five to seven years. Are they paying down the mortgage? No, really. No, lenders love this. <clears throat> they want them to be in debt their whole life. Another reason why John Burley doesn't refinance. Why? Because I get people all the time, they'll be 10 or 15 years in. This is a 30 year fixed mortgage, by the way. That's the amortization schedule. If somebody's 10 or 15 years into that mortgage, should they refinance? You should chunk it down. No. <laughs> right, that's a good answer. No. You have gotten through the worst part of the loan. More of your money is going towards principal now than interest. I don't care if you reduce the interest rate. 
Yes. So when they say if it's one percent less than what you're currently at, that makes no That is total and complete BS. That is a marketing ploy for mortgage lenders to sell you another mortgage. Can I be more direct? All right. If you're in the early years of a mortgage and you can get a better interest rate, a better payment, sure, why not? You haven't knocked anything down yet. 